um, as the shepherd, um, you know, Christ is the shepherd, but he sets pastors to be shepherds of congregations. And my job is to provide for the sheep, to protect the sheep, um, and to lead the sheep. Uh, to provide means giving you encouragement, giving you hope. To protect means making sure you know the truth, that you know God's word so that you can fight the lies that are out there, that you can persevere in your faith. And to be able to lead, to give vision and how we can do life together and finding the resources and networking together so that we can do what God wants us to do. So as I continue to pray, God, what is, how, do we, how do we move forward as a congregation of who we are today and where we're going? You know, what's the vision of what could be? Um, and so this little series is a way to kind of share some ideas and to get us thinking and talking as a congregation. Where, where, what direction do we need to be going? As we're asking God to give us steps in the right direction, we do that personally, but we want to do that as a congregation as well. Our world keeps changing. Um, the culture changes. The generations change. And we have to figure out a way to bend with those. As Kim said, the message doesn't change. But the new needs that are out there do change, and we need to bend with those things. Um, God's love doesn't change. His offer of salvation doesn't change. The truth of the Bible doesn't change. The fellowship of believers and the mission to reach the lost world, none of those things change. The journey of where a church is headed isn't just my journey, but it's a journey for all of us. So I'd like us to get some, pretend like we're at the train station and we're getting ready to get a ticket to get on board. And we need to decide where we're going, right, before we get that ticket. <coughs> we recently shed our denominational association. It worked for the majority of our church history, but for the last couple generations, it hasn't worked so well. And so it wasn't a natural fit. Then we came to this year-long pandemic that changed the way that we do things. We had an interruption. And now that we're getting things started back up again, um, you know, there are things we missed that we want to do. Maybe there's some things that we need to shed, some ways of doing things that since we're kind of out of the habit, do we need to really start things up again? Um, we need to kind of figure out what the next chapter of our church looks like. And, and you have a voice in that as well, you know? And so if there's things that we need to do differently, things we need to keep, things we need to add on, let's keep those conversations going and make sure we know what we should be doing as a church. Um, you know, that we don't want to have conversations so that we just argue over our personal preferences. Because if everybody did church exactly the way they wanted to, we would have 50 different ways of doing church in this very room. But what is God's mission for our church? What is God doing and going to do that we can be a part of? How can we best worship God, grow and serve in the context of, of this assembly that we have here? And for those of you that are online with us. So, for example doing this live stream sort of thing. This is a super hot topic amongst churches right now. Because before the pandemic, a few churches did this, but most didn't. The pandemic came along and almost every church started live streaming, started recording, started putting things online for people, which was a great way to flex using the technology that we have to be able to keep things going even when we were stuck in our homes. Um, and so now, it's not a matter of survival, and it, you know, it did help us keep us connected, but now we have a dilemma. Churches are saying, do we keep doing this or do we, do we not do it? Because on one hand, when we go to have church online, for one thing, it gives people a chance who want to just spy on a church without visiting it. It's a way to kind of see, hey, what's that church like before they go visit? And it's a way to be able to reach out to people who maybe aren't at church but are curious and maybe want to know more what it's like. And that's a good thing. Um, for those that are traveling or those that are sick, it's a way to be able to be able to keep up with what's going on, not feeling like you missed it totally, right? And so there's some really positive things about doing church online as well. The flip side of that is that having church online can be an easy out. You know, why do I have to get up, get ready, <laughs> and go someplace? Can't I just sit on the couch and just watch the service? It's a lot more convenient that way. And we definitely enjoyed that, that aspect of it when we were doing church at home on our couch. But do we want to give people the easy, lazy temptation to be able to miss coming together and say, I'll just sit at home and check it off the box that I was at church today. So 
churches around, all the, all the things I read about church leaders and pastors, that's the big discussion right now. Do we keep it going or do we, do we, do we uh, get away with it? At this point, we're going to keep it going, I think. I think it's a good thing to do. We still have people in our congregation who are socially distancing. And uh, if it comes to a place we don't need to do it anymore, we won't do it. But for the meantime, we'll keep doing it, working through the technology and the Internet and all those things and uh, making it happen. But that's just an example of a dilemma. You know, where do we go? How, what direction do we go when we're talking about the way we do things at church? Um, what I want us to do during this series is just take some of the biblical descriptions of what it means to be the people of God, to be the assembly of God, called into the thing that Jesus says, you know, I will build my church. You know, what's it mean to build the church? And so we're going to be looking at some characteristics um, over the next three Sundays. <coughs> These are three characteristics um, for a church that I want us to look at. The first is being real, a church being real. And I put down a bunch of synonyms that go with that. Authentic, candid, true, genuine, honest, sincere, straightforward. Are these the things that describe who we are as people and as a body? When people think about us as First Christian Church, are they saying, those people are real? I want to be with real people, having real life, real, real conversations together. Those would be, that would be one characteristic. Another is relevant. Some synonyms for relevant is applicable, important, valid, vital, essential, compelling, crucial, convincing, persuasive. Is, is what we do something that really is important and connects with people where they're at? Or is that just something they're just, eh, all that church, religious stuff, that's just something to, to add on to our lives. It's optional. But are we relevant? Are we out there thinking about the real needs and bringing the real truth together and the real love together with those needs? So are we a church that's known as being relevant? Or are we in our own little subculture that people have to leave their world to come enter into ours in a very strange way? And then the third thing would be revived, renewed, rekindled, rejuvenated, reawakened, invigorated, refreshed, energized, motivated, inspired? Are we people that show the life of Christ, that we're excited about him, that we have the joy of the Lord, we have the hope of the Lord, and that is contagious to a world out there that's looking for that? Are we alive? And so we're going to look at being real and relevant and being revived as characteristics that we need to have as a church if we're going to be able to fulfill God's mission. So we're going to take a Sunday each and look at those over the next few weeks. So I hope we challenge ourselves to be able to think about who we are and what characteristics we have. I think now more than ever, we need churches of God's people who are known by these things. If we want to have traction in our society and our culture, then we need to have these characteristics because these are very important things that younger generations are looking for. And therefore, we need to, even no matter where you're at in the generational pecking order, we need to become a congregation that reflects these values. Um, I want to take a look today as an introduction at the early church that we have in the New Testament because we can't just compare our church with other churches in town and say, well, we're doing it better than that church. It's not a matter of comparison and competing with one another. And we can't even <coughs> compare ourselves with who we were in the past. Some of you were here in glory days when there were so many kids and so many youth and things going on all the time. You were here during some times you remember the church being very vibrant, a very big part of the community. Whereas now, the way the culture changes, church and everything associated with it's kind of, a, kind of been pushed to the side. It's not as important to the community as it used to be. A couple warnings about looking at the early church is one that we can't put the early church on a pedestal. Often we hear, oh, if we could just be like the early church, they were so perfect, they had it all together. Well, actually, they were far from perfect. They did some things very well, like every church does. They do some things well, but they do some things not so well as well. As well. Um, you know, every, because we are people that have strengths and weaknesses, we bring into a congregation the very reflection of ourselves. What are our strengths? What are our weaknesses? And if you read through the book of Acts and you read the early letters of Paul, you're going to see Paul always saying, hey, churches, you got some things wrong. <laughs> These are things that need to be corrected, okay? 
So there's some people that are just kind of blind and they think, oh, the early church was so perfect. I wish we could be just like that. Well, it wasn't all perfect. Uh, <coughs> when we were studying Revelation last year and there were letters to seven churches, you know, to every church, there were some things they were doing good and some things they weren't doing so good. And the things they weren't doing so good, they were big ones. OK, so they were not perfect back in the first century at all. They were struggling with the same things that really we struggle with today. Um, for example, the Jerusalem church, they didn't allow outsiders in. They had trouble letting go of their religious customs. The church in Rome, which we were studying in our sermons, they had a pride issue. They thought they were better than everybody else. The Corinth church had a lot of problems, even to the extent that they even allowed all kinds of sexual sin into their congregation and thought that was just great. The churches in Galatia and Colossae, they were accepting foolish heresies, abandoning the truth. The Ephesus church, they didn't look like spiritual people because they blended in so well with the worldly people, you couldn't tell that they were any different. The Philippi church was racked with worry. The, the church of Thessalonica, they stopped working and decided to sit around and just wait for Jesus to come back. So you could go on and on, but the early church had their problems. There is no perfect church. But some people, they try to make church into an idol. They want to make church the perfect thing instead of looking at the head of the church, Jesus Christ. We don't worship a group of people. We don't worship a building. We don't worship a leader, a pastor of the church. We don't worship the concept of community. Well, if we all just loved each other perfectly, that's what we just need to have. And that's a good thing to have. But we can't worship the community. We worship the head of our community. That's Jesus. Another thing to watch for when we're looking at the New Testament teaching of the church is having discernment. What sort of things in the Bible are cultural and what sort of things are universal for all of God's people, for all of time, everywhere? How do we discern between what things are cultural and what things are truth? <clears throat> um, we have so many cultural parts of our church even today. The pews we sit in, that's a cultural thing. The stained glass windows, that's a cultural thing. The instruments we use is a cultural thing. Our little shiny offering plates, that's a cultural thing, right? Okay, as we learn through the pandemic, we can get by without all those things and go back to the basics, right? And now that we're out of the pandemic, well, how can we separate the basics, the things that we really, really need from the things that are just cultural that we could take or do without. <clears throat> we read in the Bible that the early church, they met in people's homes. Does that mean that we're supposed to do that as well? Are we outside of God's will that we build a building that we all leave our homes to come to? Or did they meet in homes? Because first of all, there was persecution and they couldn't, they weren't allowed to make a building to meet in. The fact is it's never even said in the New Testament that you need to find a building to be your church building. I mean, that's not something that was ever commanded, but people met in their homes because that was the natural place to be able to meet. Um, <clears throat> what did they do in their homes when more people came than what there was room for? Not everybody had big houses, probably much smaller than our own homes back in those days. You know, uh, is spending our money on a church building and keeping it going is that something that is a good use of God's resources or something that we could maybe do without? These are questions we got to think about, about the cultural way and the biblical way. Um, <clears throat> you know, the early church, every time that they had communion together, they would have a meal together. They would actually eat a meal and then have communion with it. We don't do that. Does that mean we're not doing it the right way? Or was that a cultural thing? You know, so we have to... When we're reading the New Testament, we have to kind of try to work through those kind of questions there. And if we did everything like the first century church did it, then we would be doing some very strange things because we would be doing it the first century way and not the 21st century way, right? But we need to, we need to figure that out. You know, <coughs> one, of the big, one of the big controversies even today, <coughs> today is that in the New Testament, women were not allowed to get up and speak and teach in the church. Was that a cultural thing or was that a biblical thing? And there's a lot of different opinions about that even today. And churches have their own understanding about that. So what I'm saying is we need to 
have good discernment when we're thinking about what it means to reimagine church to be able to discern what is a cultural thing that might be good or maybe we have a cultural thing that might be bad and we need to figure out those cultural things. And then we need to take a look at what are the basic truths that God wants for his church. And those are the things that we need to make sure we're focused on. Not the offering plates, not the candles, not the curtains, but about the things that are very important, like being real and being relevant and being revived. So as we think about these things, we need to be able to have good discernment about these sort of things. Imagine if you were invited to the White House, the guest of the president, uh, to be able to have breakfast and talk to him. I mean, that would be something we would be nervous about because we're not sure how to act when you go into the presence of a leader like that, no matter who it is. One time, there was a reporter that was invited to the White House to have breakfast with then President Calvin Coolidge, a long time ago. He was very nervous to go have breakfast there. But when he sat at the table, he said, okay, I'm just gonna watch this. Whatever, whatever the president does, that's what I'm gonna do, okay? Because you got all the China, you got all the food. So at one point, the president, he took out a saucer and he started pouring some milk into the saucer. It seemed very strange to the reporter, but he took the milk and poured it into his saucer. And about that time, the president leans down with his saucer and gives it to the cat. <laughs> when we go into a strange place, we don't know what to do. And for a lot of people, in our generations today, coming into church is just as strange as going to have breakfast with the president. They don't know how to act. They don't know what we do. We stand, we sit, we say this, we do that, we sing songs, we, you know, we do all these things that to a lot of people these days are very strange. One day I was subbing at the school and there was in the class, this is in eighth grade, and there was a reference to the name Adam. And they were talking about what is the symbolism of this guy, Adam. So I asked the class, what do you think the symbolism is in the name Adam? Nobody had an idea. Now, for those of us that have grown up in church, we think of Adam, we think of who? Adam and Eve, right? That was the right answer I was looking for. But this generation had no clue. <clears throat> and when I said, and when I gave them a clue, I said, maybe it's somebody from the Bible. And somebody said, oh, Adam and Eve. And I said, yeah. And I said, who were they? They, they didn't know but they had heard of Adam and Eve. Uh, you probably see this, right? Like biblical literacy amongst new generations is very low, right, Jamie? I mean, you know, we can't just assume that people will walk into church and when the pastor says something about, oh yeah, remember back with Adam and Eve? Not everybody's gonna know what we're talking about. And so we gotta think about, if we wanna reach out to other people, bringing them into where we're at might be a very intimidating thing. It might seem very strange to a lot of people. And to us today, this feels pretty normal, even though we're down here in this room. But coming to church is a pretty normal thing because it's cultural. we have a cultural history of being able to do that. <clears throat> so there's a lot of things we need to think through if we're going to explore the mission of the church and how do we reach out. Of course, inviting people to church is a hard thing to do because people are intimidated about coming to church. That's not a normal part for them. But you know what? The church belongs to God. You want to go to the next verses there? In Colossians 1.18, Christ is the head of the body, the church. Ephesians 1.22 tells us that Christ was given head over all things. He was given it to the church. And in Matthew 16.18, Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Even though there are challenges out there, we know who this belongs to. It's not that hard. It's not that scary. It's not that intimidating because God's in control. He wants to grow his church. He wants to lead us by the Spirit to be able to understand how to be able to do it in a way that we can worship God and grow and serve God together and be the mission of the church. And he's going to lead us. He's our head, so we look to him. And he gives us wisdom and discernment and understanding and so that we can do these things. And so we don't have to be scared of these questions. In the book of Acts, it's about the, the whole the acts of the apostles, the things that the apostles did to start the church. But actually, it's really, it's really got the wrong title to it. It should be the acts of the Holy Spirit. Because 56 times, we're told that the Spirit told this person to do that and told this person to say that. And the Holy Spirit was so involved in growing his church. Yes, the apostles were 
moving in the direction that the Spirit was leading them, but the Spirit was doing it. And we can trust that the same Holy Spirit that was there 21 centuries ago is the same Spirit that's going to help us now to be able to lead the church and move in the direction that we need to go. And so we can remember that Christ is the head. We look to him, that the glory goes to the Father, and the Spirit is going to lead us. And that's a great thing to be able to know. So I've been asking the church board to say, what direction are we going? We need to start praying about this. And I'm asking our congregation, let's be praying about this. What direction do we need to go as a church? Now that we're getting past the pandemic and getting back to normal, I don't want to fall back into just doing everything status quo. Let's think about how we can move forward in a new way, in a revived way. Even without the pandemic, even before that, in our own local congregation, just speaking to you frankly here um, about attendance and participation, that we've, been, that we've been stagnating. It's harder and harder to find people to volunteer for things, and we're not reaching the younger generations as well as we have in the past. In the eight years, um, actually this is something going on everywhere, it's not just here, so don't feel like it's just our problem, it's a problem in many churches. Um, in the last eight years I've been here as pastor in our congregation, we've had three births and we've had 20 members die. So even as far as, you know, growing through, through families, that's not happening at the rate that it, we are replacing ourselves. Nothing against the seniors that are all here today, not seniors in high school, but seniors in age, but two thirds of our congregation are senior citizens, okay, in that category. And we're thankful, you guys are awesome. We got the best senior citizens around. But the fact is, we're aging out quicker than we are growing in the younger ways. It's just an obvious fact. It's not a judgment against anybody, it's just a fact. <clears throat> when I go through the <clears throat> list of people who are regularly a part of the church, we have nobody regularly that attends that are in their 20s. So of course we're not having babies be born, right? We have five that are in their 30s. A few more that are in their 40s. And then you start moving past 50s and the, so the numbers go way up, right? So, I mean, of course, we, there's not any of us that are really around having babies these days, okay? So we're not going to grow through that, okay? So we're going to have to reach outside to be able to happen. And everybody's whispering, going, not me, I'm not doing that, okay? Yeah, we're, we don't want to fill the nursery with our own, right? Okay, we agree on that one. So that means we're going to have to reach out, right? And find people who are willing to come in and have their babies, right? Okay. But it's not all about demographics. In this, the last eight years, we've had 27 baptisms. That's awesome. Uh, most of them young people, but a few adults. Um, we've had ways to reach out in the community, having the SWAT thing at school, doing the Koyo with the other churches, um, having the Kindness Kitchen. Um, we keep our not during the pandemic, but you know, the fact that our church takes communion to the people out at, out at Arcola Healthcare, that is such a great ministry to the people who are there that appreciate that. You know, we have a great food stand at Broomcorn. We, we do our outdoor service and music and everything. We do a lot of things great and we'll keep doing what we can do great. You know, we've updated our building. You know, we've had a new roof. We have a new heater. We actually have a new air conditioner that still gives us problems every year, but, um, you know, since I've come here, we have the new video, the sound system. We have volunteers keeping up the yard, looking nice and looking great. All of you that are helping with that. It's been a wonderful year keeping it up, looking nice. We have a great sense of unity. Um, I have not been to one board meeting where somebody leaves angry or not talking to somebody. I mean, every church I've been in before, that happened like all the time. People are leaving board meetings angry, mad, not getting their way. That's never happened once in eight years here. I, I I love board meetings, you know? I mean, it's great to have a sense of unity that people say, we're gonna to work together. And even if I feel a little different than everybody else, I'm willing to go along with the rest and nobody holds a grudge. Isn't that awesome? Maybe that's happened in the past, but it hasn't happened in my history here. I think we have a congregation that's so full of generosity and love and genuine concern for each other. Um, I think we're gonna figure out what kind of vision and direction God has for us. We have a very healthy church. We have a lot of great things going for us. And I believe we're going to figure this thing out. Um, 
God calls us to be faithful, not successful. You know, sometimes being faithful means you see the results. Sometimes you don't see the results. And we can do all the faithful right things and we may see the results and numbers that we want. Or we might not. What matters is that we're faithful. And if something's not working, being able to look outside the box and go, maybe let's try something else. Let's try this. Let's try that. It doesn't hurt to try things. You know, you could always scrap it and start over again. But we need to have a congregation that's thinking outside the box. And what does God want us to do? I think, though, if we really stick to the basics, if we go to the being real and relevant and revived, that that's going to make a huge difference in our testimony to the community around us. Um, in Acts 2, after the Holy Spirit came and the first apostles started doing their work, um, we read about what happened at that time. And it says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together. And they had all things in common. And they sold their possessions and belongings and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple <laughs> together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. And if we stick to the basics of what's there, you know, they, I, mean, they, I mean, they took the teaching of doctrine seriously. They said, we want to know what to believe and why to believe it. So they knew and they had an answer for their faith. They kept the Lord's Supper as being something meaningful. It was special. It reminded them of the sacrifice that Jesus had made for them. And they had prayer as a way to connect with God. And they were committed to the fellowship. This is the fellowship. Okay, fellowship can be a verb or a noun. Here it's a noun. They're committed to each other. <clears throat> and so I think what we see here is some things that made the church very successful. And people were attracted to it. Um, <clears throat> you know, we live in an age right now where we do a lot of things distant through screens. And I think we're missing a lot of the face-to-face. And even younger generations, as much as they love their screens, they still want to get together face to face. And we need to, we need to incorporate that into our church and to be a part of a face to face type of people. So what we want to know is, what is God doing? What is God doing? We want it to be a God thing. Is that the next thing? You know, we want to be a part of what God is doing and make it a God thing. So we need to seek that and ask God, God, what are you doing? What are you doing amongst us? What are you doing in this community? And how can you use us to bring more people into relationship with you? We saw that people were being saved. People saw these things and more people were brought in and their lives were changed. And so we want to see that as well in our place at our time. So anyway, as we, as we consider these things the next couple of weeks, uh, may we be prayerful and keep the conversations going and talk to me if you have ideas, talk to each other. Let's get some things going uh, for what God wants for us.